Throughout Scripture, the reality of darkness and light is continually contrasted. Darkness is always associated with the devil, death, and evil. Light is associated with life and purity, holiness, and God. In fact, in John chapter 1, Jesus is given the name of light. It says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent by God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. Then one more verse of which there are many, John 3, 19 to 21 says, This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest their works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So with that introduction, I welcome you to part two of our two-part series on the theme, God's Word and the Skeptic's Questions. Last week in part one, Isaac and I talked with Brian Osborne, author, conference speaker, and Christian apologist for Answers in Genesis, where explained then that asking questions, if the goal is to know the truth or expose the truth as Jesus did of the Pharisees, then that is a good thing. However, if asking questions to trap or to lead someone to deny the truth and reject the author of truth, God Himself, as did the Pharisees of Jesus during His first coming, or to doubt the author of truth as did Satan in the garden with Eve, then it is a despicable and evil thing. So in this two-part series, our goal is to ask some, some of the more frequently asked questions regarding biblical issues and we're going to do that of our returning guest today, Brian Osborne, with the clear goal of establishing the truth, finding answers to questions often asked by skeptics and others who just may not yet know, for the purpose that our confidence in God's Word is more firmly established and our ability to answer the skeptic apologetically is enhanced. As we say regularly on this program, as all faithful disciples of Christ understand, God's Word tells us all we need to know about God Himself, creation, sin, and redemption. And He's provided sufficient knowledge to all people in all generations since creation 6,000 years ago about the basics of how to live blessed in our time and our age. Now, God's provided us literally all we need to know about how to live in these evil days, and He's provided us all we need to know about the days ahead, including how Christ will directly reign, as Scripture tells us, for a thousand years from a literal Jerusalem in Israel in the Millennial Kingdom, just ahead. So God's Word tells us His will and His way, and that by obeying His Word, we can be blessed. That's our goal and our prayer for you. But God, in His mercy has stamped His fingerprints and His message of truth all through creation, so much so that even if a person would not have a Bible to read, that God says that He has shouted forth His work, His will, and His way literally from creation into all creation. And with that introduction, I welcome back to the program Brian Osborne. Brian, thanks for being back with Isaac and me. Uh, great to be back. Uh, Brian, for those who were perhaps not able to join us uh, last week in uh, the program, if you could, just a brief overview of the question, linking creation, truth, authority, and God's plan of redemption. Put them all together because it all starts right there in Genesis, doesn't it? Uh, it really does. And as I mentioned last week, this comes down to do we trust God's word or do we trust man's word? And that's really what it boils down to when you get to the foundational level. And, and Sam, here's a key issue. 
If we allow ourselves to take man's ideas and reinterpret parts of the Bible, like Genesis, then why shouldn't we take man's ideas and reinterpret other parts of the Bible when it talks about marriage and sexuality and even salvation through Christ alone? I mean, if man's word can be used as the authority over certain parts of the Bible, why not as the authority over other parts of the Bible? And I would suggest for many of the younger generations who have grown up where Christians have undermine biblical authority by compromising particular parts, we've essentially told them, hey, you, you can take man's ideas and reinterpret Genesis. Well, they're like, well, if I can take man's ideas and reinterpret that, why not Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, John, Revelation, etc.? Either all of God's word is authoritative and true or none of it is. And saying that history in Genesis is foundational to every single biblical doctrine, either directly or indirectly. How do we know what marriage is? How do we know there are only two genders? How do we defend the sanctity of life? It all goes back to Genesis. And oh, by the way, salvation. Why do we all need a Savior called the last Adam? Well, it's because of sin of the first Adam, a real man in real history. He really sinned. We all really descend from him. That's why we're sinners, and we need saving. And so every biblical doctrine, even the gospel itself, is rooted in the foundational history of Genesis. That's why we must stand on God's Word as the authority from the very first verse. Thank you, Brian. In the beginning, God, ladies and gentlemen, that's where we're starting today. When we come back, we're going to, well, actually proceed into this area I started the program with, light, because God created light. There's a lot about that. We'll be back in just a moment. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment? or warning signs. The pastor, commentator, or frontline combatant. Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution, educating, Informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. You can view our in house studio productions on demand or watch what's on the station right now with our 24-7 live stream. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website for more information. Visit LighthouseTV.org to stay connected. There you can find out what's currently on the air and coming up. How to watch in your area on cable, satellite, broadcast, or streaming devices. Watch past programs or our live stream. Follow us on social media and learn more about the station, our hosts, and our programming. Lighthouse TV, positively different. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. And, and Brian Osborne, our, our special guest from Answers in Genesis, I'm just going to go to you on this next question. You're, you're there in your office at the Creation Museum. Uh, you just look like you're, you're wanting all the tough questions today. So we're going to try to throw some of them at you. Um, but uh, you, you're talking about the authority of God. You're talking about the uh, authority of Genesis. You're in a, a museum. You're, you're working with an organization, Answers in Genesis. And yet at the very beginning of Genesis, we see that in the beginning, you know, God starts creation, but things are dark and they're void of everything. And so we see darkness and then light comes. And uh, this, you know, Genesis 1 uh, verse 2 it says darkness. Verse 3, it says light. And then as we go on, we see that's the first day, that, that God brings forth light in his creative process on the first day. Yet we don't get to the sun and the stars and these you know, celestial lights until day four. So could you explain what happens here? We're saying that Genesis is authoritative. How can God create light before he even creates the sun? That's a great question. I think the short answer is the Sunday school answer is because he's God, hmm. right? It's interesting. A lot of people will look at this and say, well, God tells us that he created. 
uh, but it doesn't say how he created. And actually, that's dead wrong. The Bible does tell us how God created, that he spoke the universe into existence by the power of his word because he is God. We have to remember that all of Creation Week is a supernatural event. God is speaking the universe into existence by the power of his word. And so uh, really, when we see that, he makes light on day one by his word, by his power. And I also got the earth on day one as well. People say, okay, we've got the earth and you got life. There's a, no sun, moon, and stars. If there's no sun, how do you get a day? Well, all you need for a day is a light source and the earth and the earth to rotate against that light source. We got light, we got the earth, no problem. And some will say, but okay, but then why did God make the light first and the sun on day four? The answer is we cannot know for sure because the Bible does not explicitly tell us why he did it that way. Uh, we can make some guesses. I've heard one person say that maybe God made the light on day one, the sun on day four, to show the coming generations of people that the sun is not God. God is God. The sun is God's tool. It's part of his gigantic clock for humanity, for times and seasons to give light upon the earth. Maybe that's it, maybe not. But the Bible does not explicitly tell us why he did it in that particular order. But the text is clear that he made light, he made the earth on day one, and there's evening and morning the first day. The language of the text around the word day, it's a literal 24-hour day. The text is explicitly clear. And this idea of God making everything in six days and resting on the seventh day is throughout Scripture. Exodus 20, 11, for in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and then they rested on the seventh day. And so the text is clear all the way through. And we don't know dogmatically why he did it that way. It's an intriguing question, but we know that he made the light on day one and made the earth and the sun and moon and stars on day four, all by the power of his word. And that kind of reminds me of a program we did with one of your colleagues, Rob Webb, uh, not too long ago. And it, and it actually wasn't coming from Genesis. We went to the book of Psalms, the, the, the song book of the Bible. And the 19th Psalm, one of my favorite uh, passages about creation outside of Genesis. And it talks about uh, the heavens declare the glory of God and the, the firmament and the, the, the earth, the, the atmosphere shows forth his handiwork, his glory. And it goes on and it says there's not one language, not one culture where that language of God's glory isn't heard, isn't understood. And, and could you talk to us, what, what does that mean? Um, you know, the psalmist is saying that, that God's handiwork is seen by all, this glory of God is communicated to us. God is talking to us. We hear him through viewing what he has created that, that gives him glory. Yeah, absolutely. We may mention last, uh, last episode about how all of creation is speaking, that even if there was no word of God, praise God there is, but there was no Bible, we would still know about God from his creation. Romans 1, right? We see his attributes on divine display through creation. And we can look at the intricacy of design and marvel at the great architect of God and what he's created, everything down from the cell, even beyond the cell, the intricacies of the cell, gazing out to the universe, looking to the solar system around us, past that to the galaxies, looking at the amazing design inside of us, inside of humans, the variation in life, the variation in plants. The, I mean, yes, it's absolutely mind blowing uh, how creation is displays God's power. We look at things that are beautiful and they create a sense of awe inside of us because we understand that's something beyond ourselves and it points us to the one who actually made it. We should not worship the creature nor the creation. We worship the creator. And so we can look at the design and be in awe and be reminded of who God is. But also I like to help people understand that just looking at the design of creation, although that's very good to do, it's not sufficient uh, to understand the biblical worldview and the need for a savior. Because the atheists will look at creation and say, yeah, there's beauty, but look at all the brokenness. Look at the bloodshed. Look at the cancer. Look at the parasites. Look at these kids dying in this atrocity. Look at the tornadoes killing all these people. I mean, how can you say a good God made that? And that's where the the entirety of biblical history founded in Genesis 1 to 11 is so important because God made a perfect creation. He didn't make this world broken. We broke it in our sin. He made it perfect. But then it was man's sin about death, the enemy, into God's perfect creation. And so within the biblical worldview, we can explain the beauty of creation and marvel at it as we should. And at the same time, we can explain the brokenness and the death and the disease and use all that to remind us that we're all broken by sin. That's why we all need a Savior, the last Adam. 
And, and Brian, that makes me think of something. I'm going to go on to another big issue, the flood, <laughs> because that's another question that people have. But it makes me think of this because you're describing and what Isaac asked about the, uh, the, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God, hand, the firm shows his hand to work. Then in the book of uh, Romans in the New Testament, the first chapter, talks it very clearly that creation shouts forth the message of God and everybody makes a choice. And I think that's the part you're talking about right there because um, in my background and so forth and what you talk about, we say, you know, when we look at something, we can see and observe the what. This is what it is. But the real issue is why? Mm -hmm. How did it get here? How did this happen? And that's what leads, as we're talking, the questions, leads us to Christ, leads us to creation. It didn't happen, couldn't have happened. Got to be a creator, order, unbelievable beauty. Why, how, that is the kind of thing that we ultimately make a choice which we do all of me about salvation. So that's, just want to make that little point before we go forward here. Let me go into this other, the, the, the flood. All right, that's a big one that you deal with. You got the ark sitting right down there that people can go and walk through and I've been able to do. Many people have disputed that. Oh, no possible ability that a, a boat big enough to, a boat big enough to put all the animals in that we have? Ah, impossible. That's one question I want you to ask. And the other is, you mean to tell me there could be so much water on the earth that literally this boat could float all around the earth and end up on top of a mountain, which the scripture says? All right, so those two questions. Uh, yeah. Boat, uh, how can possibly there be enough water? Where did it come from? And number two, possibly fit all of the animals in one boat? So a couple questions there. Yeah, so we'll start with the flood stuff. Good questions, very common questions. Uh, and so people ask, well, where did the water come from and then where did it go? Well, it's interesting right now, if you were to press down the mountain ranges and raise up the ocean basins just a bit, the entire, the entire earth would be covered by two miles of water right now. The water is just in deeper post-flood ocean basins. And, and same the Bible describes when the flood took place when it started, when it started. It says the fountains of the great deep burst forth. Subterranean water burst forth through the crust of the earth all around the globe. And so this was water cracking the earth's crust, bursting forth, flooding the earth, and rain came down as well. And then that tectonic activity would cause earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic activity. The flood literally wrecked this world in a cat catastrophic way. This was real climate change. This was God caused climate change. It wrecked the world. It wrecked the environment. And if there was a global flood as described in the Bible, we expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And that's exactly what we find. And the features of the rocks and fossils just scream a rapid recent formation when they're rightly understood. You look at the rock layers. They're typically flat, one on top of the other. There are no signs of slow erosion in between the rock layers, no topography change, no chemical erosion, no soil accumulation. And according to secular thinking, these rock layers were laid down over millions of years, but it didn't rain in millions of years between the rock layers, no soil, no soil accumulated over millions of years, no erosion. And then we find all over the world bent rock layers, multiple rock layers stacked on top of each other, bent at over 90 degrees of an angle, and they're not broken. How do you bend rock layers and they don't break? Well, if they're all still wet after being recently laid, laid down by the flood and then bent with tectonic activity and then hardened in a newly bent shape, that's how I explain that without heat being involved. And we could literally go on and do a whole talks on the rock layers and fossils, how they really scream a rapid recent formation. So rightly understood, the science will confirm, science of geology will confirm the Bible's history in an amazing way, in multiple amazing ways. And so Go to the website, uh, go to the Ark Encounter, definitely check that out. You'll see a lot of answers there. And then what about the animals on the Ark? Well, you got to clear up a few misconceptions here. The Bible says God brought to Noah two of each land-dwelling, air-breathing animal according to their kind. So only land-dwelling, air-breathing animals. There were no fish on the Ark, plenty of water outside the boat for those things. And then he brought them according to their kind. And the word kind in the Bible, roughly equal to about the family level of modern-day classification. And Sam, what that means practically is this. Uh, Noah most likely never saw a chihuahua or a poodle in his life. All right. He was a very blessed man. 
He just took two of the dog kind. He took two of the elephant kind, two of the cat kind, two of the basic kinds of land-dwelling, air-breathing animals. From those two basic kinds comes the variations we get today post-flood. How many kinds did Noah need in a worst-case scenario to account for all variations past and present? In a worst case, he needed roughly 1,400 total kinds. Multiplied by two, no more than 7,000 individual animals needed on that massive boat. And the ark was over 500 feet long, 85 feet wide, 51 feet tall, three different levels. It's a floating warehouse. Fits those animals with no problem. And that's a short answer, of course. But you see, if we just start with God's word and read it correctly in context, the answers are not hard. I tell people all the time, you don't need a PhD to defend your faith. What you need is a biblical worldview. Trust God's word from the beginning. Build your thinking from there. And we got answers. And, and Brian, that's perfect. And we've got about a minute left. I want to ask you just a follow-up question because that's one of the, one of the arguments that, that you all present that a lot of people don't think about is that why did the Lord uh, have to bring on adult animals? Why couldn't he have brought on younger animals, because that would have probably been a better thing. They would have been more able to go out and reproduce quickly, right? I mean, that's another argument, right? You're absolutely right. You bring in young adults on the ark for lots of reasons. Uh, they produce more offspring after the flood. That's the whole reason you're taking them to begin with, to refill the earth post-flood. Of course, young adults would be smaller. Juveniles would likely eat less. They're, and of course, we know that youngins are tougher than adults in particular ways. They're more durable in, in particular ways, which would be helpful as well. So lots of good reasons that God probably brought young adults to Noah to go on the ark. Absolutely. All right. And, 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 and ladies and gentlemen, this is the idea. Truth is really fairly easily defendable, particularly when we're talking about these kinds of things that the Word of God gives us plain and clear descriptions. If we just believe it, all the pieces do fit together. We'll be back for a conclusion today on this part two of emphasis with Brian Osborne in just a moment. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different. years, pastors have carried the light of the gospel through opposition, persecution, and every flaming arrow of the enemy. But sadly, now more than ever, our nation is experiencing a period of spiritual darkness. But what would happen if churches threw off the shackles of fear and boldly stood for truth? If 100,000 pastors around the nation joined together and committed to preaching God's Word no matter the consequence, pastors who are unaffected by changing times and the opinions of men, what would happen if America's pulpits became aflame with the preaching of righteousness? The great darkness from rejecting God's standards would be expelled, the prayers of God's people heard, our nation healed, and God's blessings restored. The time has come to stand. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. And we just have a little bit of time left to finish up this program. But Brian, thank you so much for being on again um, for two programs. If, and if you didn't see last week's program, I encourage you to watch that as well. Uh, but thanks for being back on with us. And so I just want to squeeze into this last one, something that you and Sam were just talking about. That's Romans chapter 1. And uh, in Romans chapter 1, Paul is talking to this big urban center, the city of Rome, kind of the, the headquarters of most of the world's thinkers in those days. And he talks about creation. 
Paul is talking about creation in the New Testament, and he's saying that it, it speaks to us. And he says um, in Romans 1, I'm looking at verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. And the, the verse before that, he says, um, the invisible things of him from creation were clearly seen. Goes back to Psalm 19, the heaven declares the Lord's work to every language. They were clearly seen. Um, and uh, he says they are without excuse. That's Paul talking. But then he says in verse 21 that they did not know God and they were not thankful for him. They professed themselves to be wise. They became fools. And it goes on into this deep uh, conversation about that. And that's what I would just in the few 90 seconds or whatever we have left. Could you talk about the consequences of not being thankful for that, of not seeing that uh, the, the glories of God and of, of being with, left without an excuse from creation? Yeah, and what really we're looking at here as we look at uh, creation, as we look at the revelation of God's Word, both of those things are meant to drive us to our Creator. And of course, it's the special revelation of Scripture that helps us understand our, our need for saving uh, by the Creator, from the Creator. Because of our sin, we are destined for hell apart from Christ, and we need to be saved by the last Adam, Jesus Christ. And you know, the, the, in relation to the verse we're talking about, the Bible says this in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 7. That in the last days, scoffers will come. And these people who reject the Bible. Last days, since Christ ascended and before he returns, scoffers will come. And it says in summary, these scoffers will willingly forget. They'll willingly reject three key biblical truths. What are they? The creation, the flood, and the coming judgment. Why? Because if those things are true, and they are, here's what it means. God made us. We're made in his image. We are accountable to him. He has judged the world in the past with the global flood. He'll judge the world again in the future by fire and for eternity. And sinful man doesn't like that idea. So what do we do in our sin? We suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And really what evolution, millions of years, actually is, it's man's attempt to suppress the truth in unrighteousness, to have an excuse to reject the biblical God, to live as he wants to live in his own mind, according to his own uh inclinations and desires. It's a rejection of that truth. And so we need to understand that if we reject that truth, if we reject God's testimony of himself in creation and his word, we are searing our consciousness to the desperate need we all have found in salvation in Christ alone. Again, we all descend from Adam. We're made in God's image, inherent value because of that, but we're sinners also as well because of that. That's why we need saving through the last Adam, Jesus Christ. The last Adam doesn't make sense without the first Adam. Both Adams are central to the gospel. And Brian, thank you. We are at the end of the program. So perfectly said, thank you so much for being with Isaac today and I on this program. Absolutely. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the truth of God's word should lead us to Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. It's all about God's plan of redemption. When we look at creation, we look around us, it should point us to the Lord God of heaven, the creator. I hope and pray that you have done that and you've encountered God's word and accepted his plan of salvation for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. I hope and pray that you have done that. Communicate to us this week. Let us know that you are standing with us in prayer and finances. 